Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Evolve with Emily show. I'm your host, Emily Hayden, and today's guest is a very special guest that I personally am so excited to get into some deep conversation with about the world and our mind, the psyche, the way that we think about things. He is somebody who helps people in groups step outside of the world as they know it by identifying mental constructs that have been holding them back. His work explores the fundamental issues that affect all of us to foster a deeper understanding of our common humanity. He's a writer, a speaker, and a thought leader in human awakening and human potential. He helps free minds and liberate souls. He does that by helping them remove suffering and discover literal freedom. With over 20 years of coaching, mentorship, everyone from leaders, professional athletes, celebrities to the stay-at-home mom, he truly helps people live and walk into a life of freedom. So everybody, please welcome the mind architect, Peter Crone. Welcome. Thank you, my dear. Lovely to be here. Yeah, it's so really such an honor to have you here because when I look at your work and what you embody and what you lead and guide people to, I think it's one of the most important things in this world, literally. Thank you. That means a lot. I really, I really receive that. And I concur. Obviously, I'm biased because it's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But uh, yeah, I, I often say it's the only real game in town is as a human being, we get so preoccupied, understandably so, with being human. But to me, the actual opportunity of being human is to realize that we're actually not, you know, and to break free from the constraints with which we arrived. I love that you started here because my very first question is, who are we actually and what are we? Um, that's a great question, and I'm going to defer to uh, an expression from Buddhism, which is neti neti. And what that means is not this, not that. So it's sort of we get to who we are by realizing who we're not. It's sort of the conundrum of being consciousness itself, but not knowing that we're consciousness, right? We can only be aware of that which we see or that we feel and relate to. So like take thoughts, people think that they are the conversation in their head. It's the most insidious part of us because it's the closest. You're in your shower, you're in your car, you sit down at your desk, you go to bed at night and you hear this incessant conversation and you think that's you. But if you just understand it logically, you can't be that which you're aware of, right? So that starts to point to. So I would say the access to understanding who we are is to first remove the who you think you are right? Mm. Or as I tell people, I don't solve problems, I dissolve them. And that dissolution process is the revelatory process of who we actually are. Now, if I want to get poetic, which I enjoy, I enjoy language, I'd say who we are is boundless, timeless, limitless beings, whose qualities include freedom, love and possibility, inherent worth and immense amount of power to create the life we want. Incredible. I love hearing you speak and express yourself because it's literal music to my ears and to my heart because it is what I feel so deeply. I resonate with it. And when I hear it, I feel so, I feel so, I think just deeply grounded in truth. And I know that it's truth. And I think that our soul, when we take the moment to really connect with it, we recognize truth. Yeah. It's actually not hard to know. And it's easy when you connect with that to yeah. then, like you're mentioning, see the opposite of everything that is not truth. What do you think creates a disconnection in people's ability to see clearly? Well, great question. I first want to acknowledge the, the prelude to that, which is really beautiful. I mean, obviously, we haven't met before, but there's a there's a remembering, right? You know, one the sort of the real in interpretation of namaste you know the soul in me recognizes the soul in you so i just want to speak to that so thank you thank you um it really is why i'm so passionate about what i do because the number of times that i have heard somebody of, of great you know experience age uh, they've studied a ton of things say to me you know what you're saying something that i've kind of heard before but for some reason the way you say it i just got it which is super humbling and flattering, but I don't know to what degree, obviously there's a certain combination of words that I use, but I would also assert it's the underlying energy with which they come. So I would assert because I'm speaking from that space that it awakens or the frequency resonates with the essence of who you are. So thank you for that. Um, would you just repeat, so I wanna really speak to the question, the, the last part of the question. 
What do you think creates a lack of clarity and people's ability to see truth clearly? Like some people can look at it in the eyes and not yeah. know that it's true. Yeah. What do you think is creating such a disconnection? So in lay terms, in a very simple way of responding that what we would call the ego, the identity, one's personality, which is really the facade. It's the ambassador, albeit a lousy reflection of the person that we're trying to be, right? It's the little child that's wanting to garner love and acceptance. So it becomes the obstacle. The, the you that you are for yourself is the impediment to the you that you actually want to become. Can you repeat that again yes. in slower layman terms? <laughs> the you that you are for yourself is in fact the impediment to the real you that you wish to become. So good. And I would say that in, in a way of the mask that you're choosing to wear yeah. is the blockage to letting your authentic self shine. Yes. And because of the degree to which I know you're impeccable with this work, I'm going to say it's not even a choice. Mm. So the mask that you choose with the words you, you use, there is no choice for which that actually allows for compassion. I use the expression, you can't be held accountable for that which you're oblivious to. So that at least then introduces the absence of wrong making and judgment, especially in relationships where partners tend to go at each other. But we only know what we know and we can only function from within the degree of awareness that we have within that knowing. Right. And so that to me, at least it allows for our humanity, which would be a gift for many people because there's so much judgment predominantly at ourselves. So to go back to your question, it's that where we are. It's so insidious and it's so slippery, but we are so misidentified with the thoughts, our brain and this meat suit as though this is who I am and the way that we use words. I'm a particular age. I'm a particular height. I'm a particular nationality. When we say the I am statement, whatever follows that becomes where we are now located in time and space. Mm. But if someone, for example, says, I am overweight, is a very simple thing in the world of exercise and fitness, which you've inspired so many. It's a, it's a disservice to the essence of who you are. Who you are is a boundless, timeless being who's founded in the principles and qualities of love, freedom, and possibility. But because you've misidentified with the narrative, which is this linguistic fortress based on the experiences you had invariably in childhood, but actually it goes further back than that, you have created an experience of suffering because you become misidentified with your true essence, meaning you feel separate. When we're separate, we have no choice but to survive. In the state of survival, you do anything you can to mitigate suffering, try and find pleasure. And these are the substances that people use. And in this case, the person finds food as a way to mitigate the dissatisfaction, the lack of nurturance that they have because they're living in an identity that is based in inadequacy, insecurity, and scarcity. So they are not overweight. They are pure absolute possibility looking through a lens of limitation that creates suffering that leads to relief in food that's an entirely different way of categorizing somebody's weight problems absolutely and i think it helps to create that separation from something that they are experiencing and what they actually are who right. and what they are so we experience suffering in so many different ways it mm -hmm. can express in relationship and the way that we view ourselves and the mm -hmm. real experiences that we've had in this life what do you think is the root of suffering and why is it that we're addicted to our own suffering? Great question. So the root, it goes back to what I was sort of saying there and alluding to is the illusion of separation. Mm -hmm. That there's a me here, there's a you there. Now, of course, in the manifest world of the 3D reality that we all experience, of course, I mm -hmm. can't quote unquote come from your perspective. I can't feel what you're feeling and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But as it relates to the actual essence of who we are, there is no separation. Mm -hmm. But the actual format, the structure of the identity, the personality is by design a separate entity. Mm. As long as we look through that, then I write in quotes, you may have heard me use a lot of them, but I say, as long as you think that you're a separate individual, then you have no choice but to survive. Mm. Wow. Right. So if you really get that, what most people don't understand, people talk about things like purpose all the time, especially in these circles of spirituality and self-improvement, which is beautiful, dharma, whatever you want to call it. But people are like, what's my purpose? And if people really understood their purpose, like as it is, not as an aspiration, mm. but who they are in the way that they choose unconsciously purpose, it's normally to make it, to survive. Mm. And if you're in that state like certainly emotionally, psychologically, but then it cascades into our physiology. So you're in sympathetic fight or flight, mm -hmm. which is why people get sick, by the mm -hmm. way, 
then you have no choice but to suffer. Mm. Right? So that's why people suffer is because you're misidentified with this being. Mm -hmm. No, it's not the being, sorry, the human part of the human being. The being I would associate with the soul. But thinking you are the human with the conversations and narratives, the inadequacies that we all become misidentified with, that is a unavoidable state of suffering because you're in conflict with your true nature. Mm. See, the I am statement that I refer to is a very powerful foundation upon which to create. I am, fill in the blank, committed to whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. What suffering is founded in is what I call a negation of self. So if I'm asserting, and again, it's just Peter Crone's opinion that who you are is a timeless, boundless being whose qualities, et cetera, et cetera. Ironically, all the things the ego wants, we already are. Yeah, so good. Just get that first. Mm. But if I'm saying I'm not something, but I am everything, then it's in complete conflict with my truth, Mm. right? So that not statement is resistance, which Mm. creates suffering. Mm. So that's the first part of your question, is Mm. that I am in denial of the essence of who I really am, my infinite self, and I've become misidentified with a constrained view. Mm. As I tell people, you can't see the infinite through the lens of the finite. Mm. That's hell that lives ironically inside of heaven. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's a big one, right? <laughs> that's a good one. So, so, so but I want to get to the second part of your question. So that's because people think they're out like this, right? Hell's here, usually up. Heaven, uh, hell's down, sorry, heaven's up. No, 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 no. Heaven is so vast. That is love. Mm. Hell is an aspect of it. But when you're in hell, you don't know that you're also in heaven. Wow. I know, it's a powerful visual, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So anyway, to the second part of why do people sort of sustain, perpetuate, and want to be right about their suffering is because the imperative, the absolute imperative of the ego is to be right about its own existence. It has to be because it's fictitious. So this is what self-sabotage is. Mm. I'll prove to you that I can fuck up, fill in the blank. Whatever I'm actually really like craving for beautiful That's love so and relationship interesting. isn't it insane how we sabotage the thing that we want the most yeah because in that case what you recognize is what we really want or that aspect of us the hell version of us mm-hmm. what it really wants is to sustain its existence that's the survival component because of the ultimate fear which is death mm. but here's the rub the greatest thing that can ever happen to you is dying why because then you become truly alive. Because I'm talking about the death of the idea of yourself. So good. Because you, the essence of who you are, don't die. Life doesn't die. We are born and then, you know, we quote unquote die in terms of the physicality, but life sustains, right? Mm. So the, the death of the idea of yourself is actually the birth of the true essence of yourself. Oh my gosh, so good. I want to speak to people that struggle with the thought of ending their life, that yeah. the message that they're getting in their head is that I need yeah. to end. Yes. What do you feel that message that they're getting is really communicating? What does that message really mean when they're feeling that? I mean, I can right now feel like pins and needles mm. is the term we use, like hairs on the back of my neck standing up because, mm. and I hope people really hear what I'm saying. This is one of my favorite topics to speak to. Mm. As devastating as it is, I've helped so many people understand what is so misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Suicidal ideation, the I that is the conversation of I want to end my life, it's all pointless, is one of the most poignant times in a human being's existence. Why? Like I I literally got called by, it doesn't really matter who, but a big recording artist in the UK who I used to help. And he said one of my friends was a big fashion designer, his business went under. And he is currently drinking himself to death. And we think tomorrow is going to be his last day. Because he, in his mind, had lost everything. I didn't know this guy from a hole in the ground. And they said, you're the only person we know who could probably stop that. Mm. So they gave me his number. We did a WhatsApp conversation. I could feel the resistance. He didn't want to hear another person telling him all the things he already knows. But you're amazing. You've got so much to live for. Look at all the bullshit, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And so I didn't. I said, Liz, first of all, I want to meet him there, right? When everyone's in that state, we want to have the compassion. We want to have the empathy. We want to listen and get their reality. That's Mm. true for them. Mm -hmm. But I said to him, if you're interested, I'd like to tell you why this is one of the most powerful times of your life. That piqued his interest. Yeah. So then he got on a call 
And so I will share with you what I shared with him, which is to answer your question. The part of the human being, and we've all probably been there. I know I have. I was often yeah. at a young age, both parents dying. Like, what mm. was the point of me staying alive at mm. that point? Wow. Um, so that I that says it's worth for me to be here mm -hmm. i'm worthless i want to die mm -hmm. the essence of who you are first of all never dies mm. you can't die and you don't want to die but there is a part of you that is asking to die mm -hmm. that's entirely different because the way this gentleman described himself he said i'm i'm a useless washed up fag no one cares mm. and i said but that's not a truth that's a conversation that's how you perceive yourself. It's not an absolute truth in the universe. About the only truth that I'm still grappling with a bit is gravity. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I say grappling because I'm still looking. Yeah, you know, I'm still looking to overcome it at some point. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. But everything else is truly a conversation. Mm. So when I asked him, "Is it an absolute truth?" in his words, that he's just a washed-up fag that no one cares. Like he he couldn't deny the truth that it's not a truth. And in the absence of that, how would you feel? And that's where he started to step into the new iteration of him, which was being born, which is why I said earlier, the greatest thing that can happen to any of us is we die. Because in order to be alive, you have to constantly die mm. to the idea of yourself. Mm. That is true liberation. Wow. So that's why, to answer that question of why people have that and what do they do, is to realize you do not want to die. There is just a part of your narrative that is founded in limitation that is asking to be relinquished, to die, to let go of, because the bigger essence of you is wanting to be born. Mm. As I tell people, the ego is nothing but a boa constrictor for the soul. That visual is incredible. Yes. So that boa constrictor in this case of limiting language is asking to be relinquished. Mm. That is a form of death, but it's also the most incredible expression of life. Wow. Just want to sit in that for a moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, it's big because it's sadly at this point an accelerated experience for people. Mm -hmm. And if they don't understand why, then we do see the, you know, tragic end yeah. of actual human existence, mm -hmm. right? Where people are taking their lives. Yeah. Don't take your life. Mm -hmm. Let go of the story that's currently suffocating the life mm -hmm. you are. I, I'm going to share a small experience please, because it relates to this. It's not a small experience. I won't make it small. <laughs> okay, but good. I often say that reaching what felt like to me was my deathbed was mm -hmm. the most transformative experience of my life. Yeah. Because for me, it didn't come from a place of self-harm. It was I wanted the pain to end yeah. and I didn't see a life without my pain. I couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. But the guiding questions that helped me to choose to stay were, number one, am I proud of the year that I just lived? And I said, fuck no. Like mm -hmm. that was filled with so much pain. I didn't be the fullest expression of who I am. I didn't do what I was put on this earth to do. Yeah. You know, and I asked a few other questions, but what helped me was being at that place. I came back to life. When I came back, I said, okay, you can be done, but you have to go do these things first. And you have to give it your fullest effort for 365 days. So I gave myself literally a year where that mm -hmm. was no longer an option. I had to live as the fullest expression of me. Yeah. I had to live as who I was called to be. And if at the end of that, I still felt that pain, I told myself I could have that out. And I know that that's not the healthiest thing to say. And I'm no. not saying that people should do that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying that's what I did for myself. And yeah. in that... I no longer cared what other people thought about me. I yeah. no longer cared about the bullying, the hate, all the things that I had gone through. Yeah. And it allowed me to just be free, to be the fullest authentic expression of me. Because I yeah. wanted to know that at the end of the year, if that was my last year on earth, that I would be proud to die from that life that I was living. That's amazing. So what do you, thank you. What do you say to those people that they, they just want the pain to end and they've tried everything and the pain is not ending. They can't find a way out <laughs> of the emotional turmoil and pain that they're feeling. Yeah. First of all, what I say is I love you. Mm. It's okay. There's someone here who gets it, who cares enough to listen to what you're going through. Um, and that it's okay. It's okay to feel that. Mm. Um, and that if they would be open to it, I would love to understand more and then give mm. them perhaps a different perspective. And mm -hmm. like this gentleman that I helped, who then went on to live in a 
incredibly different life, you know, most people are open to some contribution. So first of all, I really acknowledge you for the strength and the courage you had to get through that. That's beautiful and no doubt one of the reasons that you inspire so many people. Mm, thank so you. I just want to speak to that and acknowledge that because that's not easy to lift yourself up from your own bootstraps, you know. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's It was a death of self. I experienced yeah. a full death of self and in yeah. that was a rebirth of the authentic version of me, yes. which is with so much soul freedom. And that's why when I look mm -hmm. at your work and everything that you're doing. I think it's the most important work in the world because it's allowing people to truly walk in freedom and yeah. be free of the bondage that they've carried their entire lives. Thank you. That's yeah. totally my commitment and why my platform is called Freedom and why I've just, I'll share with you, this is hot off mm -hmm. the press. I've just come up with a new, very aspirational, um, we could call it a vision statement, mm. which is to inspire 1 billion people to discover true freedom. Wow. Yeah. So that's just in keeping with what you shared. But I do want to address the question of like, what do people do? I would make the distinction, use the word pain, and they can't get away from the pain. It doesn't seem to stop. Mm -hmm. Pain, for people to understand, is unavoidable. We're sentient beings. We are going to stub our toe on the coffee table. We're mm -hmm. going to get toothache. We're going to throw up. Suffering is what we're removing. Mm, wow. So it's very clear. So the suffering is what I hear in the question and what mm. people are experiencing. Pain, fine. We have systems for that, you know, mm. where, okay, I speak out about allopathic. I don't think it has anything to do with healthcare. We do not have a healthcare system. We have a sick care and a disease management system, which is, it's appropriate. It needs its place. Mm -hmm. Like in emergency triage situations, you know, with interventions that save people's lives, epic mm -hmm. but nothing to do with health doctors aren't yeah. trained in health they are experts in pathology mm -hmm. right so pain let's put it in its right space mm. suffering is an entirely different proposition which i would assert is all self-generated mm. you're either a victim of life or you're fully responsible for the experience you're generating now i'm not saying the latter is an easy place to stand in but it is nonetheless the only powerful way to live Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's someone else's fault. Fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Parents, boss, spouse, kids, whatever, ex. Um, so that is the conversation we're generating, the interpretation we have of our life circumstances that is creating our own experience of suffering. One of the powerful distinctions that I got for myself very, very young was it was very evident as a human being when my parents died that people thought I was a victim of circumstance and I mm -hmm. bought into it, right? Because people would say, sorry for your loss, sorry for your loss. Sorry. And it's like something bad happened. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it was ideal and I missed the shit out of my parents mm -hmm. and I had the best parents, especially my dad. My mom I was very young. So he and I became very tight and that was very difficult, but I didn't lose anything. My dad died. Mm, wow. Subtle distinction, right? So in the interpretation of being a victim of those events, I would suffer, but when I realize I'm not a victim of anything, I'm a victim of perspective. Mm. Whereas I could look at it as I do now, that I was blessed for 17 years to have the most extraordinary father who loved me like I have never heard a father lo love anybody else. So was I at a loss or did I have the most ex incredible find of a parent, of a care provider, albeit for a short period of time? I know. Friends now who the parents are still alive and they've had them for 70 years. They haven't once told them they love them. My dad told me wow. every day. So wow. we don't look at things in terms of, for me at least, in terms of the quantity, but rather the quality. Mm -hmm. So that's where I would ask people to look at pain versus suffering. Pain, unavoidable, inevitable. You're human. You're going you're gonna to hurt mm. physically. Mm -hmm. However, what I'm dissipating, what I'm committed to removing and dissolving and mitigating for people is suffering because that is unavoidable but only once you remove these deep subconscious prisons that most people are oblivious to this is why we start with compassion i get it mm. but perhaps when you look closer you're living in a lie that you think there's something wrong with you and there isn't so good and i love that you say that because often when i have conversations of people and they open up mm. honestly for the first time and they'll, they'll even say this is the most honest conversation i've had in a very long time yeah and I have the opportunity to tell them it's okay to feel that way and yeah. you're not wrong. And I feel that we have this idea in our minds that we are the only ones that are suffering with this thing or mm -hmm. that there's something wrong or broken about us because we struggle with this 
you know, whether it's a habit or uh, something in our lives that's bringing us pain. And so what about, you know, this idea that they're the only ones suffering in that way or they're alone in their suffering? Yeah, I get it. And, you know, it's, I think it's a default setting again of the ego because we want to justify our experience all the mm-hmm. time, right? We ra- we rationalize things away like, oh, well, this was too good tr- to be true because, and we, we can explain ourselves into any kind of woe. So I think the more conversations like this happen, the more that people can get involved in communities where there mm-hmm. is a safe space, which isn't mm-hmm. always easy to find. This again is why I've created freedom because already the people in there are like, I've never felt so seen, so heard, so held. Mm. And I can say anything and all I hear is love and acceptance, wow. right? Where most people don't get that. Mm-hmm. So so I get it, but it's a little bit of the self-fulfilling prophecy of the ego to justify its own woe is that if I'm the only one going through this, Mm. then I can justify sitting and wallowing in my own suffering, right? When you start to realize, oh, hang on a minute, even if by virtue of, you know, com- misery loves company, when you understand that some other people have been through the same thing, are going through the same thing, it's like, oh, perhaps I'm not such a freak and there's nothing wrong with me, you know? So it is hard, but I think that's where it's important to, if you can find a safe space, you know, mm-hmm. we don't toss pearls before swine as the expression right you know and that's hard i mean i i've had clients i mean one i remember distinctly she was crying and i was like what's going on she said i i've never felt loved like the way you're loving me because Mm -hmm. there was always something i was doing wrong or there was always something wrong with me and you aren't judging me for anything Mm. and most people sadly don't get that experience. And mm-hmm. then it just starts to propagate into their own judgment of self, right? It might start as the enemy is without, you know, but then it becomes our own enemy within mm. um, because of what we learn and we mimic um, the role models that we have. So so try and find as best as you can a, a community, a safe space, even just a friend or even journal, you know, mm-hmm. because even if worst case scenario you're in a bad position right now you're you're hurting and you're suffering mm-hmm. and you really don't feel there's anyone that cares enough to listen the fact that somebody can hurt that much shows me that they care that much mm. and if they care that much what they can do is write down their story mm-hmm. on a piece of paper leave it for a day or two come back and read it as though it's one of your friends or a child that you care about Wow. And then what energy would you bring to that person is the energy that you're asking for. That's so good. And I remember when I was going through my time, I wouldn't journal because I didn't want to really recognize and accept how Mm -hmm. difficult things had gotten. Mm -hmm. But the moment that I did, that was the start of my breakthrough was being able to have that safe space, even just with myself, like what you're mentioning. You mentioned freedom a few times. What is freedom? As a word or as my platform? As your platform. Oh, okay, as my platform. <laughs> but sure, we could go deep yeah, into sure, it <laughs> like, That's got a pretty vast description <laughs> and quote. But um, yes, as, as this membership platform I created, it's been something that I have quietly, consciously, unconsciously been creating in the background for years. Because I realized when you look at the world today, because of the way that people are conditioned, programmed, and the way that we all live from this place of limitation, Mm -hmm. fear, and suffering, really Mm -hmm. that's the default kind of operating system of a human being. And then we have all of our ways of mitigating that and coping and sort of adapting, and we become people pleasers, perfectionists, and whatever. Mm -hmm. I realize there's no safe container for us to truly be us. And so my original vision statement for myself was to inspire the birth of a new type of human being. Wow, I love that one too. That didn't go away, did it? No, it's still sort of, I guess there's some cinnamon, you know. <laughs> that should like, definitely still be there. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, so what does that mean? It's it's the realization, the essence of who we are, which is a human being who rather than being driven by limitation, which creates fear and suffering, mm-hmm. one that is created in freedom, which is our essence, that then gives an experience of love of life and a sense of possibility for everything moving forward. Mm. So that's what freedom represents. It is what I call the combination of spiritual awakening mm-hmm. to our essence combined with human optimization. Wow. Because we normally find experts in the two fields as separate, right? Mm-hmm. You've got your spiritual teacher, you've got your rabbi, you've got your priest who will talk to all things divinity, and that's beautiful. 
but they might not be so good as it relates to beautiful, passionate relationships, great sex, mm. making money, mm -hmm. being in great shape, you know, mm -hmm. and because that was my history as a trainer and studying human biology and everything like, and I'm now into, I don't like the term biohacking, but health optimization. I was like, well, I am here. This is my vehicle and the way that I interact with life as a being with other beings. So yeah, I want to recognize and honor the essence of who I am. Mm -hmm. But equally, I want to maximize and explore the potential of what it is to be human. Yeah. So that is freedom, a safe space within which you get to alchemize soul and matter. Wow. Incredible. And I fully agree because I I'm, I'm both right. I care so deeply about the spiritual elements. And yeah. also the way I view it is this is our vehicle that we get to ride throughout this earth planet in. Yeah. So why would we not want to have the most badass vehicle possible? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's like, otherwise you're going on a road trip in a, you know, nothing against a particular brand, but an yeah. old, old Toyota <laughs> that's got a rusty, you know, God knows what carburetor right. and the tires are flat and, you know, the windshield's cracked. And it's like, well, you might be the greatest driver in the world, but if your equipment is compromised then you don't get to fully express your capacities. So good. You talk about the four stages of growth. Uh -huh. Can you share about the four stages of growth and how we can transition from each stage, like what that mm -hmm. transition looks like when embodied? Mm -hmm. I, if you're speaking to what I think you are, it's not, it's not mine. I, I forgot. I think it was an old time psychologist, the Maslow. I'm not sure. So okay. I want to give credit where credit's okay. due, but mm -hmm. um, I do cover it. And so it starts with unconscious incompetence. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that we have a limitation in competence, not as a judgment, but there's some sort of compromise in the way that we can't express ourselves mm -hmm. physically, uh, verbally, but we're unconscious about it. It's a blind spot fundamentally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then as we evolve and you do the work, you get reflections with friends who care, you talk to a therapist, you do my mastermind, you come into free, whatever it is, you become consciously incompetent. Mm -hmm. So now you're aware of your incompetencies. Not necessarily a great way to live, but it's, yeah. a, it's a great up, right? Mm -hmm. And then you become consciously competent, meaning so you knew what your shortcomings were like, oh, my gosh, I've sabotaged every relationship because I felt that I wasn't lovable. I wasn't enough. Right. But that was a deep thing. I didn't know why. I just kept realizing I'm by myself. I get into these arguments. It doesn't matter how hard I try, how much people pleasing I do. Then you become aware of, oh, my God, I'm not good enough because my older brother was the one that always got the accolades. He was the better athlete. So I felt that my parents didn't think I was enough, whatever the genesis of it was. Right. So now you're like, I can see that I'm not good enough. Like, oh, that's the awareness of the incompetence. And now you become competent, uh, consciously competent. So you're like, I'm not going to allow that to affect me. You'll feel it. And it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm trying to prove myself. I'm aware of it. So I'm not. I'm going to listen. I don't have to justify my behaviors. I'm more than enough as I am. Mm. But it takes a bit of work because you're aware of it. And then the final stage is you become unconsciously competent. Mm. That is where something is second nature. It is the Michael Jordans of the world and the, you know, the Roger Federer's who can do the things that are seemingly effortless, but it's because they become so unconsciously able mm. to perform. So that to me is the highest state where we are, in my vernacular, functioning from the soul we are. Mm. which has these inherent qualities of uh, I've spoken to of like love and value. These are inherent, right? So that I speak from that place versus the human ego, which is based in limitation, that's trying to prove mm. that I'm love and freedom and value and all those things. Mm. So. It sounds to me, and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. that the last stage is embodiment, yes. the true embodiment of the soul's expression. Exactly. No, it's a great way of putting where it's just effortless because it's who I am now. And that's why mm. when I, you asked me to repeat something earlier, which I could not repeat, <laughs> <laughs> now um is you know that the you that you are for yourself mm. it's not because people talk about limiting beliefs it's not a limiting belief a belief belongs to the you that you are for yourself until you realize the you that you are for yourself is founded in limitation mm. that limited you has beliefs well you shouldn't do this you shouldn't do that but you're aware of those mm. right so it is the embodiment is that that's who you are now is somebody who in this case is totally comfortable in their own skin and people to your point earlier that you know, you were never actually worried what other people thought about you when you were telling your story. Yeah. You were actually worried what you thought about you. Mm. Other people were simply the reflection for you to have that exposed. Wow. That's yeah. so true. And I think it speaks to the fact that everything that we're experiencing in our external world is simply just a reflection of the internal world. 100%.
What are some ways that you have found to navigate that internal world to become aware of what's happening internally, maybe daily practices or healing modalities? What are things that you've done to raise that awareness to the internal world? Sure. I mean, my immediate answer might sound flippant is just live life. (laughs) Just live life because you're going to get triggered as fuck. Yeah, it's true. So, you know, one of my more popular quotes that gets you know, circulated kindly by people on Instagram or wherever is that life will present you with people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free. Mm, Wow. So that's the game that I said at the beginning. To me, it's the only game in town is like we're here to emancipate ourselves and the constraints with which we arrive. That's why freedom is my main product. You know, Mm -hmm. you're not here to amass money, the sexy partner, the followers, the Mm -hmm. big home. That's fun in the human domain. What you're here for is because we actually incarnated in human form so that we can transcend Mm. the fears and limitations with which we arrived. Mm. So how do we do that? Live your life. (laughs) Because life will show you where you're not free. So good. As long as you're looking and listening and aware. (laughs) And not avoiding, right? Because one of the strategies of the ego is to cut people out of your life, the Mm. the person who you are pissed off at or who hurt you. And I'm not saying that for sure if there's an abusive relationship that you suddenly become like best friends and invite them over for Thanksgiving. Right. You know, there are times and places where it's appropriate to obviously choose self first and then realize that maybe that person isn't a healthy individual to have around you. But if it's a way that you're trying to have avoidance of something because you don't want to look at something and you're placing it on that person, then there's an opportunity you're missing to discover freedom and love on the other side of that. So really, um, yes, they are the tools, techniques that I have, which is, as they say so often, fuck around, find out. I love it. (laughs) I love it so much. It's funny because that year that I spent, that was my theme of the year was, you know what? I'm tired of living in fear. I'm going to fuck around and find out. And I give myself full permission to do that. It's the old, uh, again, not my quote. It's a great one, but like playing it safe is the riskiest way to live. Wow. So good. Yeah. So okay. get out there and, you know, and again, with all due respect, you know, mm-hmm. you don't want to put yourself like there's the masochists of the world who want to face pain. That's a whole nother expression Different. of ego. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but, you know, to really just, you know, to not be scared, to face the things that are discomforting because, again, those arenas where we in the sort of popular term now get triggered, you know, in lay terms where you just get upset, you feel a potential threat. Mm -hmm. There's an opportunity to recognize where you are still not seeing how extraordinary you are, right? Wow. That's, that's your, the lie is that I can't be with what's going on, Mm. you know, outside of obviously real dangers and Mm. physical threats. Uh, Again, my quote, I say, you know, if it's not life-threatening, it's just ego threatening. That's good. And that's a good thing to be threatened because you want to let go of that. Mm-hmm. You have a quote that I would love for you to expand on. Okay. It says, I have an intimate relationship with reality. Yeah. What does that mean to you? That's a great, uh, no one's ever asked me about that one. I thought it was going to be one of the others. But um, so what that means is presence in a one word. Mm. Intimacy to me is a misunderstood word, and at least the way that I delineate it, it's an energetic expression, right? Mm -hmm. Into me, see, intimacy, meaning be with, to really be with somebody. Most Mm -hmm. people don't experience intimacy. They can have sex, they collapse Mm -hmm. it with physicality, but let's face it, especially with all due respect to guys out there, most women don't experience intimacy. Mm -hmm. They experience pump action, very much physical action. Um, intimacy is where I have an intimate relationship with reality is my way of saying I'm fully present with what is. Mm. I want to honor the way life is. Most people are trying to get to the way life isn't. As I tell people, you know, most people are trying to get to a life that they don't have, right? Or trying to be somewhere they're not. And that's why they suffer. Conversely, if I can be fully where I am, fully with you right now, Mm. with no other attention to anything else, Mm. There's no greater gift I can give myself and you because Mm -hmm. that's full attention. Mm. That's intimacy. I love that so much. When I read this, it really struck me and I wanted to bring it up because I love truth. I Mm -hmm. love the authentic truth of the authentic truth of the moment. Mm -hmm. And I find that not a lot of people love truth the way that I do. So when I read that, I was like, oh, I think he loves truth. He loves what's true in the moment. And what you're mentioning too, I think, is something that this generation specifically deals with is an inability to be vastly present in a moment, Yeah. right? Like sitting here thinking about, okay, what's the next question or what am I going to do later? Or 
all the things that could be on our mind. Yeah. What has helped you cultivate a life of presence of being deeply present in each moment? By first of all, seeing where I wasn't, where I wasn't present mm. and realizing that that cost me one thing my entire life. Mm. Only a small thing. Only a small thing, yeah. As I jokingly say, the only thing, the only thing of any importance missing from anyone's life is themselves. That's wild. When you really get that, like that again gives me chills, right? Like even though I write these quotes, they kind of come through me mm -hmm. and I'm the beneficiary of them because I realized that I too at times was caught in the, the hamster wheel, the rat race of trying mm -hmm. to get to somewhere we're not, right? But all that's doing is reinforcing the fact that I'm not intimate with reality because I'm not comfortable where I am and I'm trying mm -hmm. to find comfort. Mm -hmm. Even in the in uh, Declaration of Independence, it's the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. What does that speak to? That your the happiness lag. you seek is in the future. Mm -hmm. There's something inherently to whatever degree, and there's a cascade and a gradient, there's something wrong with where you are. Mm. But for me, like, you know... There's nothing greater that you can afford yourself or somebody else than being truly present. Mm. Like truly, that's it. That's it. That's the whole game. Because there's an underlying lie that people live within that is one of the blind spots, one of the 10 prisons that I speak to mm. in my book that I'm talking about is these subconscious constraints that we all have and they, they flare up to varying degrees based on your, your human experience. But that people are under the impression that the life they have right now with all of the circumstances and the way that they are, isn't it? This isn't it. Mm. And people even have the expression, I'm getting there, which again, just confirms that this isn't it. But guess what? This is it. It's always it. Mm -hmm. Now it moves, yeah. but the degree to which I can stay intimate relationship with reality and mm. harmony with reality mm -hmm. versus being in my imagination, which can either be the projection of a future that I think is aspirational that I want to one day get to where my happiness lies. Mm -hmm. You've never been in your future, anyone. So that's not where it's <laughs> so good. <laughs> Conversely, or the memory of experiences mm -hmm. that were either hurtful or even, you know, that were aspirational and that you romanticize about mm -hmm. and you want to get back to people. Mm -hmm. are, I just want to get back to there's no getting back to and there's no getting to you're just here. Mm. So that's intimate relationship with reality. What is your relationship to time? <laughs> <laughs> how, how long you got? I knew you were going <laughs> to say that. Time do you have? How much time do you have? Depends what time means to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, no one's ever asked me that question. Um, I would say, first of all, the word that comes to mind is I'd say very healthy. Okay. That's my relationship to time is very healthy because, again, it's really the absence of time, right? I think, and I'm probably paraphrasing that Einstein said, you know, that the um, the story of past, present, and future is nothing but a persistent illusion. Mm. Because so my present relationship included. To, Did you say present included in that? Yeah, uh, yeah, or maybe past and future. Maybe I don't know. I, uh, is that why I said I'm paraphrasing? Probably Got terribly. It. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, so time. So there's there's. So I think we have to break it down. Like often people talk about desires and I talk about, well, there's different types of desires. You know, some can be reactionary, some can be very explorative and creative. But for me, time sort of sits into the same distinction of either it's psychological time, mm -hmm. which is where suffering exists, mm -hmm. but there can also be within that, there can be aspirational imagination, something I'm committed to, declarations of what I want to create and build in a life. But there's the time that to me is just the passing of time that we call calendars mm -hmm. and stuff like that. The procession of the sun, which is another illusion. It's not yeah. going anywhere, yeah. right? <laughs> the sunrise and sunset, no. <laughs> um, but so for me to, to really, you know, um, address your question with integrity, I'd say my relationship to time, as I said, is very healthy by virtue of the fact that I tend to not spend time or energy or attention in psychological time. I want to be where I am. So that to me is why it's healthy because I'm here, I'm present. Mm. Now I do dedicate time within my day where what I am attending to mm -hmm. is in my head of what do I want to create. When I first envisage freedom, that didn't exist. It was a thought, it was an ideation. And then it's whatever do I have to do to execute to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So that can be sort of the aspirational idea of time in terms of a commitment of a creation. Where people suffer, put it this way, all suffering can only exist in time. 
Mm. There's no actual suffering here because if you have the intimate relationship with reality, there is no suffering because it's choosing life as it is. Mm. It's profound acceptance for what's so. Suffering is, but I don't want it that way. Well, now mm -hmm. you're in your head and you're resisting life. Wow. So that's why, again, healthy is both as a way of being with life. It's healthy, but it's also healthy because I'm not in a state of fight or flight, which is resistance, mm -hmm. which is why people have sickness because they're in a state of dis-ease. What is disease? It is dis-ease, the absence of ease. I'm not at peace with the way things mm -hmm. are. So good. Yeah. want to ask about loneliness. Yeah. Because often you've shared how people, what they're really missing is like this deeper essence of who they are. Yeah. So to the people that are at home and they're listening to this on the weekend and they're feeling loneliness even right now, yeah. what could you sh say to help shift their perspective on experiencing loneliness? My first response would be the same as the last one, which is, it's okay, I love you. Mm. I, I get it. Mm -hmm. I really get what it's like to be lonely. And at a level that most people don't, because mine was visceral, mine was literal. When my dad died, I was an only child. My mom had already died. So loneliness for me at that time as an experience, we could argue no one would begrudge me, was literal. Mm. Um, so I get it in ways that most people fortunately don't have to, right? Because mm -hmm. they might still have a parent who's alive, they might have a sibling, they might have a spouse, they might have a kid. So I was, quote unquote, the only me as it relates to biological family. Wow. So I get it. So first of all, as I said, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. The opportunity with the experience of loneliness is to realize the difference between the experience of loneliness and the actuality of loneliness. The experience of loneliness is asking for what? companionship mm. to be seen to be held to be heard the opportunity therefore is for the essence of who we are to make space for the human experience of loneliness but loneliness wants companionship and we often misidentify that with someone else mm -hmm. people might say join your church group go to a yoga class go and join bingo go to somewhere community is involved that can help offset the feeling of experience but it doesn't actually mitigate the actual genesis of loneliness it's like no different than someone who has to have a drink to find relief from stress or they smoke weed or whatever they do to try and mitigate suffering you're not actually dealing with the root cause so the way to actually truly, once and for all, embrace, embody loneliness is to recognize it is part, an intrinsic part of the human experience. What it's asking for is companionship, not from someone else, but from the essence of who you are, which is the practice of love. Loneliness is an opportunity to practice love, which is making space for the part of you that feels lonely. How do you tangibly do that? Be with the loneliness. Mm. feel it let it be there mm. it's okay and it might what does it look like you might lie in the bed and cry you might sit quietly on a couch or a futon or whatever you're doing and go it's okay i am human at one level and the part of me as human one facet of that is to by default feel lonely to feel separate but the essence of who I am, which is connected to the collective that can, it's impossible to be lonely, mm. is broad enough, big enough, and vast enough to hold space for this little human clod that I've become misidentified mm. with, which is just asking to be held. It's okay. Mm. The irony there is that when I really identify with that essence of me, the being, the soul, and make space for the human that feels fragile, vulnerable, and lonely, then what happens in real life is I tend to be a beacon and I'm mm. probably then going to ask, leave me alone. <laughs> right. I want to be alone. <laughs> totally. Everybody is suddenly falling in love with me because right. I'm expressing <laughs> the so energy true. that everybody wants. So enjoy the loneliness while it lasts. That's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken from somebody who's been down that path. Yes, and, and with all due respect, I love all the affection and attention and sometimes I get stopped, but sometimes I also really want to be alone. Of course, so, yeah. yeah. And enjoy being able to be in the shadows. And be yeah, quiet. I yeah. feel that. I have a few questions Please. from uh, some personal friends oh, okay, great. that I promised to ask. Yeah, good. So the first one. Peter, you often speak about the concept of not being enough as a common limiting belief among people. In your view, what are the first steps someone can take to start unraveling this belief and to begin seeing themselves in a new light? Great question. Thank you, friend, whoever that was. <laughs> Her name's Nikki. <laughs> Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Um, so um, there are no steps 
and there's just the revelation, the realization that the I'm not good enough, I'm not enough. We want to ask where does it reside and what is its form? Like yeah. literally where in the body? Sometimes for people it can be as you gestured there to your stomach. That mm -hmm. might be where they feel the experience of that narrative. Mm. That's not where it lives. That's mm. the byproduct of believing that or being that person. If who I am for myself, using that term again, is that who I am is I'm not enough then yes, you're going to have the experience of nausea, butterflies, tightness, shortness of breath. These are all the ways that that energy manifests in the body. Mm. So there's no steps. That's an improvement process. That might be the strategy that someone who is not enough uses. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my hand up first in a Zoom where normally I would hide, or I'm going to offer to do the presentation in the workplace because I would normally be petrified to do that. These are strategies on top of I'm not good enough. The actual way to reconcile and mitigate it is to investigate where is it and what is its form. Well, where is it? It's in your head. Mm -hmm. Most people point to that. Mm. And what is its form? It's really language, right? Like, I'm not good enough only exists in noise. We're vibratory beings. Mm. It's literally a sound. Mm. And when you really get it to that degree, to that level of breaking it down and unpacking it, you can't help but laugh and realize that you're being stopped by sound. Wow. And so we could emit a different sound. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> that's, that's creation. That's cool. Isn't that powerful? However, to be really um, impeccable with understanding this, sometimes people see the I'm not enough and the sound that they use on top of that is affirmations. Like you're a champion. They'll look in the mirror. You're amazing. Mm -hmm. It's fine. It's a strategy, but it's, you know, again, it sounds crass. It's whipped cream on shit, right? Like that was... <laughs> That's, That's awesome. <laughs> it, I can't say claim to that one either. I'm not a fan of affirmations. <laughs> not, not a fan. I mean, it's a strategy, and I'm not a fan of most strategies because strategies mm. are used by the ego to try and compensate for the thing that it doesn't actually want to let go of. Rather than really getting to the root. Rather than seeing what's on the other side of that where you discover you don't need strategy because I am everything and I, there's nothing that I'm missing, right? So I hear you. Yeah. And I also think about the person that has lived their life for 35 years yeah. that has viscerally felt that they are not enough. Yeah. Is simple awareness enough for them to truly snap out of it? No. So awareness is the first step. Okay. Practice is the second. Okay. So to finish the point yeah. and the whipped cream on shit as well, because yeah. it's a great story. I was playing golf with someone as I said, I can't stay claim to that expression. Uh -huh. One of my buddies who's hysterical, so cynical, so resigned, God bless him. <laughs> totally. <laughs> it's his ego that. that it's all fucking pointless. But, <laughs> but hysterical is, you know, we're playing golf. And for those of people who might know golf, fine. Those of you who don't, please, you know, humor me for the story. You know, it was a par four. Four, meaning you're supposed to get them four. Ideally, if you're good, you'll do a three, which is called a birdie. That's great. But, you know, he was lying on the green, meaning not he, but the ball was lying there. And he made a huge putt, meaning it was over a long distance, about 50 feet. And everyone said, great putt, because it was. Right. Like mm -hmm. it's, the probabilities of him making it are very limited mm -hmm. from that distance. But he said, yeah, whipped cream on shit because it was for a seven. <laughs> like, so he'd had a bad heart. Oh, right? so, yeah, so yeah. So it's a great putt, but a shit score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I've used it multiple times. Love that. <laughs> so, yeah, so the person who feels and they've had the 30 years and da-da-da, mm -hmm. like, first of all, I tell people that your feelings are a lousy indicator of truth, mm. right? It just justifies the addiction of the ego that manifests in the way that you're familiar with the biochemistry of your body. doesn't mean it's a truth. It just mm. means you get to be right about your perspective all the mm -hmm. time, right? Mm -hmm. So the I'm not enough, yes, awareness isn't quite enough, depending on the profundity of how somebody sees that. If it's something that is so categorically clear, you're like, oh my God, I've believed that I've been that for 30 years and the degree to which they've suffered because of that mm -hmm. can be often mitigated immediately by the relief of seeing it's not a truth and they never go back sometimes. Oftentimes the practice part, which is the second component, mm -hmm. is that now you get to be the person, the birth of a new iteration of yourself on the other side of the lie, which takes practice. So you get to now consciously competently be somebody who's and this is the if there was an ip to my work it's what i call the double negation which is the not not good enough it's not the you are good enough and friends will say oh but you're amazing and no that doesn't help we want to see the lie the lie is that you're not enough what would be the truth about that you're not not enough so in the dissolution the removal 
you get to experience something innately. Mm -hmm. It's like in the absence of feeling you're not enough, how would you feel? Most people don't normally say, I'd feel enough. They feel, I feel free. I feel relaxed. I feel at peace. Great. Be that person in the world. That's the practice. That's really something different. Isn't it? Yeah, That's what I do in my whole mastermind. Like that, my whole three month mastermind is committed to teaching people this double negation by showing through all the knots that people have not good enough, not love, mm. not valued. There's 10 predominant ones, as I said, that I speak to. And when you see somebody realize that the knot they've been living in, which is also a play on words, right? K N O T, which mm. binds mm. us, the, the boa constrictor. When they see that the knot that they've been imprisoned in is not a truth. Mm. The joy, the liberation, often the tears, but the sense of relaxation and the breathing patterns that I pick up on immediately, the shift in the absence of that constraint, nothing like it to witness. It's the most beautiful thing to see. I see why you're called the mind architect. <laughs> That's really incredible. Thank you. Such an incredible answer. Hey. The next one that I'll ask is in a dynamic where one partner is at a certain stage in their own journey and the other partner hasn't started their journey, their spiritual growth, their mm -hmm. personal development and awakening, so to speak. Yeah. How does the first partner get the other person to start, especially women? How can we do that by evoking action from our men instead of doing things for them, mm -hmm. showing all them the steps or demanding action from them? And I know my response to this, because I've been that in relationship before and it really does not work <laughs> in my own experience. Yeah, yeah. But I'm very curious what your perspective is on that. Great question. So again, the problem lies in the question is invariably the case. So what's implied in that question? And this is from your friend who? Or does it not no, matter? No, no name. No, 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 yeah, no name for this one. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm about to embarrass her. No. <laughs> uh, so Mrs. Anonymous, mm -hmm. albeit innocent, her question is loaded with judgment. Mm. Because it's implying, where, you know, when one person is on the spiritual path and the other person isn't, is as subtle as it is, is a wrong-making declaration. Wow. Because you could say that a butterfly that goes past a chrysalis says, well, what the fuck is wrong with that guy? <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> I don't know if you know my logo's a butterfly. <laughs> oh, no. Well, there you go. It uh, is. So I yeah. just relate. Yeah. But that's what's happening, right? So, so this good. person is, I'm the butterfly, I'm flying, and that fucker's just hanging around on a branch. <laughs> so good. <laughs> but what they are negating and not aware of is that the spiritual path is happening. Mm. So much of spiritual go growth is unseen, mm. right? The amount of transformation and literal metamorphosis that is occurring within that confined space mm -hmm albeit oblivious and that is blind to the naked eye, is nonetheless, they're on the spiritual path. So for your friend, consider this. No one, no one is not on the spiritual path. Now, what that would breed in her is ironically her spiritual path, <laughs> which is what? Compassion, mm -hmm. acceptance, mm -hmm. both of which fit under the auspices of love. That doesn't mean that the partner she's with is the best or right partner, but at least get rid of the judgment. Mm. Because if you want to be on the spiritual path, what I hear is somebody who's resisting the spiritual path, which is to step closer to love. Mm. Here's what happens. When that person can stop making the other person wrong for their illusion of not being on the spiritual path, mm -hmm. that's totally their perspective, which is the confinement, and they step into the love and acceptance of that human being. It is the energy of nurturance that ironically would pull that person a little bit more expeditiously out of the constraint that they mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. So the judgment that they're feeling towards that person is equally the contributing energy to that person in their eyes not going anywhere. Mm. It's so subtle, mm -hmm. but it's so powerful. Yeah. If I can be a stand for that person's greatness, not because I want them to become someone, but because I accept them for who they are, then it is actually an invitation for them to become a better version of themselves. So I would invite that person to consider at a much subtler level. One, see the judgment. It's okay, you're human. But there will be at a very deep level that's not pretty to look at, mm -hmm. some payoff she gets mm. by making her partner wrong. Mm. Wow. She gets to be slightly bigger, slightly oh, yeah. better. Mm. Now, I know as a general 
generalization, yes, I would assert that women are far more evolved than men just by the incarnation of being feminine, more in touch, more in tune, more intuitive. Yes, but because of that asset and that skill, I could also say it's more incumbent upon you to step into unconditional love more readily than the male. Mm. The male can provide safety for sure, and then sadly in this world for freaking centuries, women have every reason not to trust men because of the abuse and harm that's actually happened, which is devastating, and I apologize on behalf of men, but now hopefully men can start to grow up, provide a space that is committed, that is really at least remove harm. If you can't fully commit, please stop abusing, whether it's emotionally or certainly physically. But the invitation for the women as it relates to relationships, the safety they can provide is to allow the man to express himself. Mm -hmm. What happens oftentimes is a woman doesn't feel safe is more a physical domain of safety. But what women don't realize is in their power, in their intelligence, in their greater evolved state, they often don't provide the safety for a man to speak his truth or his feelings or his vulnerability without being attacked. Mm. The reactions, the drama that men speak of and why women complain that men don't express their feelings. Well, my invitation is to what degree are you a safe space to speak into? So good. What is love to you? Everything that we've just discussed. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, love. Um, gosh, it's one of my favorite topics. And love is our true essence. Um, love is the allowance of everybody to be who they are, where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, love is the expression of the divine in me that sees the divine in you. Mm -hmm. And it is, love is often the absence of something, right? Love is the absence of judgment, the absence of, ju of criticism, the absence of making somebody wrong. It's, it's having an intimate relationship with reality. So good. I think this is a really beautiful place to end today's show. So Peter, thank you so much. That was really incredible. I feel so honored to have been a part of this discussion and to be able to bring it to my audience. I know it's going to help so many. And mm -hmm. I know, you know, there's a lot about social media that is not great, but I think one yeah, thing yeah. that is really wonderful is access to minds and thoughts and expressions mm -hmm. such as what we've had here today. So thank you so much for your time on today's show. Thank you. It's really, I mean, it's beautiful. Again, for somebody I've never met, I really just am present to the joy of being with you, you know, mm -hmm. in your presence and how much you care. And, and mm -hmm. thank you for having me on and listening and having such beautiful questions. So I hope this touches people mm -hmm. out there. Me too. Thank you. I received that fully. Well, you guys have probably just had your minds blown, as have I. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do us a favor and you can tag us on your stories when you post it to Instagram. Uh, shoot it to a friend if you think somebody would need to hear something from today's show. And don't forget to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. That's the way that the show grows. Or if you're watching on YouTube, then hi, what's up? Hello. Give us a subscribe, a like, whatever you feel like. Just give the show a little bit of love if you enjoyed this and received something from this today. Thank you guys so much for listening to another episode, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, everyone.